Hi, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for joining us for the North America and Spain Seafood Opportunities Within Market. Um, my name is Natalie Bell. I am Head of Trade Marketing for Asia, Europe and the Middle East at Seafood Scotland. Um, today we are kindly joined by two of my colleagues, um, JC Jeffrey, who is our in market specialist for North America, and Audrey Leng, who is our in market specialist for Spain. I will now hand over to JC, who will take us through some uh, of the seafood opportunities that are available in North America. Hi, everyone. Uh, good afternoon to you. Um, I'm uh, very happy to be joining you today to uh, talk a little bit about some of the opportunities uh, available in North America. Um, I'll take you through for the next uh, 20 minutes or so um, some of the trends and opportunities that we're seeing in market today. Uh, Audrey will then do the same thing for 20 minutes or so and we'll have an opportunity at the end to field any questions that you might have. Um, at the bottom of uh, on, on your controls you'll be able to um, uh, ask any questions and Natalie will be able to field those for us. Um, so please feel free to ask questions during the course of the uh, session uh, on the Q&A and then um, Natalie will pick them up at the end of the two sessions. Thank you. Um, so what you can see on screen hopefully at the moment is a, a map of the US, no surprise there, but what I'd like to start by saying both for the US and for Canada is that um, we shouldn't look at uh, the US market uh, as one big homogenous market. It's really um, a market of a number of regions uh, around the country and this is a great illustration of that. Um, you can see uh, Great Lakes, Northeast, Florida, some of these markets, Southern California, uh, represent significant markets for, for us in terms of targeting. And we'll talk a little bit uh, in the presentation about how um, targeting by market actually starts to affect the type of products, um, uh, fresh, frozen, private label, uh, and, and formats, uh, whether it's uh, retail food service as well. So really, it's, it's just a, a reminder that uh, that looking at the marketplace really is about looking at region, regions uh, within that. Um, same aspect too is the same for Canada. Um, Canada has uh, 10 provinces uh, and three territories, Ontario and Quebec being the most significant in terms of population. Uh, and again, because of geography and size, um, taking a regional approach to, to the market is, is always uh, best. So I'll talk uh, today a little bit about um, food service and retail and uh, a little on private label. Um, obviously the other channel being e-commerce, I, I won't touch on too much today, but we're seeing certainly a, um, a growth in e-commerce and how uh, particularly seafood is, um, is being distributed across uh, the continent. Uh, e-commerce has a, a growing role to play. So just in terms of a reminder, I know some folks on the call are, uh, are, are professionals and, and do this day in, day out, and some people don't. So really, in terms of route to market for North America, whether it's the US or Canada, um, and in having an importer of record is the first step. Um, then distribution, typically at a regional level, whether it's through specialty distributors or more general broad service distributors like a Cisco or a US Foods. Um, right the way down to a, a retail uh, or a food service uh, end user restaurant level. <clears throat> in terms of the sales channels, um, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that later on. Uh, this is really just for you to take a look at um, uh, post the presentation, but in terms of market segments and what the typical channels of purchases look like. But if we take, for example, um, chain restaurants and hotels, they're really going to be looking at uh, approved distributors um, at, at a very uh, national or even potentially international level, uh, all the way down to some small independent retailers, which will really rely on relationships with a, with a, a small, mid-sized uh, regional uh, distributor. 
So I'm going to touch into trends at retail. I'm, I'm going to walk, uh, walk us through this fairly quickly. There's a number of slides, but it's, it's really um, to give you a, a flavor of what's happening at, at, at retail. And today, really, it's the consumer is about looking at that balance in protein between meat uh, and seafood. And, and we're really seeing um, uh, a decline in, in meat eating in, in the United States uh, and Canada. <coughs> Excuse me. And a, uh, and a and a growth in um, flexitarian and uh, pescatarianism, and really that uh, that folds into to this slide, which really talks about what today's consumers are looking for. It's really replacing meat with seafood, <clears throat> and the uh, USDA still recommends um, a, a, an ever growing pr proportion of protein coming from seafood, uh, and in 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 the US. Uh, that's still uh, significantly lagging in terms of percentage of overall diet than uh, other countries around the world. But certainly in terms of when seafood is eaten, um, you can see the stats um, certainly within the past week um, is still over half of the share in terms of uh, consumption. And that uh, by and large, two thirds of that is consumed during the dinner, uh, during the dinner hour. Um, consumption for lunch uh, still, uh, is still significant and what we're seeing uh, growth, although it's very small for breakfast, we are actually seeing a, a growth in the breakfast category. <clears throat> so why, um, if you look at why consumers prefer farmed or well-caught seafood, I think we've got a, an interesting story to tell here in Scotland around that which is wild um, is, is perceived as being better flavour and better quality uh, whilst uh, farmed is certainly seen as better texture and uh, some of the sustainability um, aspects such as antibiotic free and better for the environment uh, and more nutritious. Um, so really when we're talking about uh, seafood some of the attributes that uh, consumers are, are, are really looking at will, will vary between farmed and, uh, and well caught. So in terms of US seafood consumption, um, it's, still, it's still rising. We're up to about 17.1 pounds per head. That's the third largest per capita consumption in the US, uh, uh, in, in the world. Um, and certainly since COVID-19 began, we've seen a huge jump in, 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 the, in the proportion of frozen uh, seafood consumption. Um, that is reflected across the board um, at retail and um, particularly in value-added uh, seafood. Um, increasingly, seafood counters and product packaging are showing the accreditations against the fish species, such as MSC and ASC. Um, this is something that we've been doing much more in the European context and certainly in the UK. And we're seeing that more and more awareness uh, rising in, in the North American marketplace. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and particularly in private label, um, we're, we're seeing that um, becoming more and more prevalent as, as, as you can see for some of the packaging here in terms of some of the um, product sets, um, whether it's in salmon, crab, um, haddock, you can see the MSC certifications and the real um, focus on bringing those to on-pack uh, right up front uh, messaging. So if we look at, uh, at, at food service for a minute, now obviously notwithstanding the challenges of today, um, food service really um, is a mainstay for seafood in terms of uh, in terms of demand. Um, fine dining uh, really takes a, a strong uh, proportion of seafood, but we're seeing all the way through the uh, food service channels um, a, a fairly constant uh, element in terms of seafood. Um, and when we look at, uh, as I mentioned earlier, where we're looking at breakfast or, on menus, we're actually seeing quite some significant growth, particularly on the fish side. <coughs> Excuse me. If you look at the frequency of, of what operators are looking at, uh, uh, over 80% have seafood on the menu year round. Uh, and that's a significant um, market share for, for us. But when you look at the, the whole seafood, fresh versus uh, frozen. In fact, half of all operators have noted that when they buy fresh, they end up freezing it anyway. So one of the things that we really need to think about is um, overcoming that idea that um, frozen is, is a bad thing 
Um, and, and that perception in the UK and Europe is certainly there. In the, in the North American marketplace, because of our logistics, because of our geography, that's certainly not the case. And, and today's technologies in, in freezing down um, great seafood uh, and bringing it back at, uh, at retail or at food service is, is definitely something which uh, North Americans aren't afraid of. <clears throat> what is certainly clear is uh, for both operators and consumers that um, the humane core, the harvesting, um, sustainability, traceability element is still um, very important to, to both consumers and to operators. But if you actually look at whether or not they actually consult formal guidelines or, or, or seek out accreditations, they tend not to. So it's really about what we have the opportunity to tell them, um, whether it's um, through the sales process, through the distribution process and the distribution channels, or whether it's on, on packs at retail. So it's about how we can, we can communicate um, those sustainability credentials um, directly to the consumers because they're, uh, and to the operators, because they're not actually gonna be the ones who are seeking it out. So if we look at some consumer trends, um, if you look at um, uh, that kind of cycle of inception through to ubiquity uh, and growth for a moment, um, we can look at some of the seafood species and I'll, and I'll linger here for a moment um, just to um, really call out a, a few elements here. If we look at the inception side, some of the um, predominant Scottish brands or, or Scottish uh, species are, are in this inception and adoption stage. Um, so if you look at steelhead trout, for instance, if you look at cod, if you look at uh, certain types of salmon, um, hake, um, look at monkfish, mackerel, those all are in that inception adoption phase. And these are relatively new, newer species uh, in terms of consumption uh, in North America. Uh, and if you start to look uh, along that curve, um, you know, some of the more traditional crab, uh, and uh, haddock, halibut, salmon, of course, uh, and regular cod is, is in the is in the upper end of the of the scale, and really that's what we're seeing is how that splits down by um, by what consumers are saying that they they really love, and of course at the top end of that scale, uh, shrimp, lobster, crab, salmon, tuna uh, are really the the top five in, in that in terms of percentage of appeal that uh, consumers uh, have identified that they love. So it's great news for us in terms of salmon. Opportunities certainly, uh, if you look further down the scales and things like cod and other whitefish, uh, if you look at trout uh, and even uh, some of the species like halibut and mussels as well. If we split it down through, through some of the demographics real quick, uh, Gen Z, um, who are big influencers, particularly in food service and going out. Uh, if you look at some of the um, preferences there, salmon features features highly there. Uh, same on millennials, uh, salmon, mussels, uh, crab feature um, preferentially within the millennial uh, set. And even when you look at Gen Xers, um, they have a much broader species um, uh, preference but again, if you look at some of um, some of the species that we would traditionally um, uh, supply out of Scotland, uh, whitefish and cod would feature on that list. And same even in the boomer generation, again, uh, a fairly broad uh, spectrum of species. But if you look at halibut, trout, cod, lobster, um, these are all mainstay uh, exportable products to our marketplace. And again, just overall, in terms of menu penetration within food service, for instance, you know, you're, the, the top ones are, are salmon and tuna. And of course, uh, salmon, uh, whether it's in, in fresh, frozen or smoked, uh, is still our, our largest exports to, to, to North America. But opportunities, certainly um, in other species. So if you look at some of the trending fishing fish varieties, um, again, Arctic char, which is a, again, similar to, to cod, uh, king salmon, uh, particularly out of Alaska, uh, black cod, again, um, seen on the Pacific side, um, but haddock, um, again, is, is trending. So looking at opportunities around haddock could be a really, um, interesting one for us. 
we look at fish pairings in terms of flavors. This, this talks to um, some of the areas around um, value-added seafood. Uh, again, some of the traditional flavors like lemon and pepper and garlic. But if you start to look down, down there, you're adding um, some other uh, what would be seen as ethnic or uh, world flavors such as ginger, sesame, salsa, herb and lime uh, uh, fish pairings. And again, if you start to really look at the what the growth in menu flavorings look like, sriracha, um, pickled onions, chimichurri, crema, salsa verde, some, a lot of the Latin uh, flavors and influences in there, as well as the Asian influences uh, in particular. Uh, similarly, across uh, shellfish and other seafood, um, shrimp, of course, is consumed um, a lot of, uh, broadly across, across uh, North America. But crab, uh, and in particular, the larger crab legs is, is what you tend typically see in, uh, in North America. But again, in Asian communities across, the, across North America, particularly in Canada, you see um, the demand for brown crab um, and uh, lobster as other ones. If you look at trending at uh, uh, in terms of the other uh, key shellfish, um, again, octopus, blue crab, uh, and, and virtually all of the other crab species uh, really feature highly on that. Um, if you go to some of the shellfish flavor profiles, again, very similar to the seafood. Uh, again, the kind of Latin American and Asian influence uh, across that are, are, are really driving the growth uh, and flavor profiles on menus. To go back to what I, I mentioned earlier, and that's about location. Location really matters. And I want to illustrate that in a couple of slides here. Um, this is a really interesting uh, slide um, in terms of um, looking at where salmon is uh, consumed across, across the country. And it's interesting to note uh, Norwegian salmon, uh, which is where we typically uh, are competing. Um, really heavily uh, focused in the, in the Midwest of, of the US. Uh, King salmon, Atlantic salmon, Atlantic salmon typically Canadian, uh, as well as European salmons. Uh, King salmon, of course, Alaska salmon, uh, particularly as you'd expect in the Northwest of the US. Um, but salmon across the country uh, and its, its ubiquity, its popularity, uh, its health benefits are, are, are well recognized both at retail and at food service. Um, so it's just really interesting to know how regional variations can, can play into this. Um, the same thing on the, um, on the next slide, um, which is, uh, focuses on crab. And again, as I mentioned earlier, crab is particularly common in, in the south and consumed in, in, in the south and southwest. Um, but when you look at, um, again, similar demographic splits across, across the country, varieties of crab um, matter uh, and so how we tell that narrative and where we tell the narrative uh, and where we distribute um, product is equally as important. I want to just pick out a couple of metro areas as well again just to kind of illustrate that by um, by seafood. Um, if 100 is average seafood consumption you can see um, how in Chicago some of the uh, tilapia perch um, indexes really highly in, in Miami, you're going to see a lot more of the uh, Caribbean uh, types of seafood. Um, bacalao, which obviously is a cod variety, corvina and branzino. So those are, again, uh, kind of thick uh, fillets of fish that, uh, that are used often in, in, Latin, in Latin cooking. Again, going up to the northwest, Seattle, uh, no surprise to see some of the more traditional uh, seafood uh, varieties, cod, halibut, uh, crab, of course, and same in the Northeast if you look at uh, um, uh, Boston as well. In Hawaii, you're looking at um, uh, seafood that goes into poke in particular. So those are the tuna varieties, mai mai, uh, as well as black cod. Um, uh, and as I say, in, in Boston, we were looking at some of those traditional um, clams, tuna, uh, tuna, lobster, but also things like haddock. I mean, look at the haddock uh, numbers on that. So overall, in terms of some kind of 
bigger trends that uh, that we're seeing that are here to stay. Um, you know, uh, coming through, we're seeing um, that that kind of uh, inception to ubiquity curve again. Um, I'm going to focus on a couple. Sushi burrito um, is a really interesting one. That kind of fusion of Mexican, uh, Latin, and Japanese cooking into a, a great uh, seafood uh, handheld snack. Again, portable, easy to easy to prepare culinary. Um, you can be very creative with it and, and create some great um, Instagrammable pictures as well. Um, seafood jerky, we, 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 for, for a while we've been seeing the trend increase um, in, in better and healthy jerkies and um, uh, only a small amount of operators in food service and even, um, even in retail uh, currently offer some type of seafood jerky. But almost half of all consumers are actually familiar with jerky as a as a as a trend. So definitely an area where uh, it's being underserved right now. And if there's opportunities to look at jerky as a as a as a uh, an option in, in your portfolio, that's certainly an area to look at. Um, for that, for those of you who have who've heard us talk about seafood in North America for the last two or three years, pokey is certainly a trend that uh, we identified early and and had really has has moved into the mainstream. Um, again, um, whether they're uh, raw fish bowls or other fish bowls with rice and fresh vegetables, again, not a huge amount of operators that are uh, currently offer it, offering it, unless you're uh, particularly in the convenience deli or uh, fast carry out. But certainly there's a consumer awareness uh, and, and, a growing, and a growing love for this type of alternative healthy convenient uh, uh, food item. If you look at um, some of the things that we're more traditional with, um, premium breading, um, how do we elevate the fillet? Uh, and really in, in the North America uh, context, this has been very, very traditional. Um, I think we are much further ahead in the UK in this. Um, you know, a third of all operators at food service are saying that they currently offer something that's um, in breaded or premium breaded, but there's a huge amount of awareness, of course, at the consumer level. So um, it's some innovation around how you elevate fillets beyond um, just the standard. Uh, tr uh, traditionally, at, uh, at more premium outlets, uh, whether it's at uh, retail or food service, surf and turf, uh, pairings are are there again. Um, you're seeing uh, seafood pairings with uh, with meat or other dishes uh, moving well into the mainstream. And again, that that Latin uh, that Latin influence, uh, particularly in the southern states, um, really exemplified here by fish tacos. Um, really, really simple, but um, a very very uh, uh, innovative uh, channel. Uh, again, um, real growth in this area, huge amount of consumer uh, familiarity and increasingly operators are, are looking at fish tacos, whether it's as a, as a starter or as a main course, um, or whether it's a takeout item um, where they can add fresh ingredients uh, to, great, to great fish or seafood. Um, this is real, a real area of growth. The other trend that we're really seeing is in the language that gets used both at uh, retail and at food service. Um, the, uh, what we're seeing the most is, is, is the phrase fork tender and this idea that, uh, that products um, are slow cooked, that are fork tender, that are braised, that there's been time and attention taken to, uh, to that product. Um, um, and this is just an example of some of the uh, outlets that we've identified where that, that, that phraseology gets used right across the, the, the spectrum of species, as you can see there. And it's really about how you can start to differentiate that offering through the way that, there is, that the seafood has been prepared. Back to what we were saying earlier about the global inferences, again, how that manifests itself, huge growth in things like the tacos, as I mentioned, Ari. And again, traditional European and, and Asian dishes like arancini and bao, 
uh, croquettes, um, pierogies. Again, using um, very traditional um, carry-out food and, and, and infusing that with, with great new flavors uh, and great fresh seafood. And again, just giving you some, some indications of how that kind of manifests itself uh, in, in different ways. <clears throat> and again, going through into, into the kind of main dishes, uh, going back to that idea that uh, we're seeing a lot of that uh, kind of fusion and, and melding of, of, of different cultures uh, and different flavors to give you everything from pokey to etouffee from the south to be a battered fish um, right across that right across that spectrum. So really what we're talking about there is um, how we target the market uh, and being really targeted and focused in terms of that market and distribution, using your innovation kitchens, using what you're doing in innovation and being really customer centric and being able to look at um, a retail or a food service solution. Um, really looking at what you're doing in the UK and in Europe as, as, um, as potentially a, a benchmark for North America, because North America is behind particularly on value added seafood. So um, certainly looking at what your, uh, your, what your portfolio looks like in the UK or in, uh, or in Western Europe is, is certainly a, a good indicator. And please don't be afraid of that frozen format. Our geography is such where that's really uh, an important part of, uh, of, of, of the offering. So with that, um, I know there'll be some questions that we'll leave towards the end, but um, I'll turn it over to, to my colleague, Audrey. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, JC. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Audrey Lang. And as Natalie mentioned, I am the in-market specialist for the food and drink industry in Spain, based in Barcelona for the last two and a half years. Today, I'm going to provide some insights into the current opportunities and challenges in the Spanish seafood market. Um, I know a lot of you will be worried about your existing European markets with Brexit and COVID. Um, I'm not here to explain that it's going to be easy to get into the Spanish market going forward, but I am here to help with the process. Um, what I do want companies to understand is that there are new ways of working um, in the market. And as long as you can provide innovative solutions to the current challenges presented, it shouldn't be a problem trying to get into the market. Okay, let's get started. So let's see if I can move this. <laughs> so you'll see from this first slide that Spain was Scotland's fourth largest export market for food in 2018, worth 150 million to the Scottish economy. This makes it a very important market for future exports and the seafood industry makes up a large part of this. Spain consumes a lot of seafood, more than it can supply, and imported products are necessary to meet the demand. And Scotland is considered to have high quality seafood, so I do receive a lot of requests for this type of product. If we look at HMRC stats, specifically for UK imports to Spain, I've highlighted the individual categories. I don't know why that's changed across. Who's done that? <laughs> Stop. So if we look at the HMRC stance specifically for the UK imports to Spain, I've highlighted the individual categories of seafood that grew or remained stable from 2018 to 2019. The figures for 2020 only show exports to Spain up until April 2020. However, given the situation with COVID, the expectation is that figures will be lower this year for all imported products in the market. Despite the challenging times, I do see opportunities for shellfish and crustaceans, chilled and fresh fish, including fresh salmon, fillets of fish and canned products. Although overall there is growth for frozen fish in Spain, most of the products in this category are sourced from Portugal, Netherlands, Mexico, France and Morocco, so I haven't highlighted this for Scotland. Um, for dried, salted or smoked fish, the supply is mainly from Iceland, Faroe Islands, Germany, Netherlands, Norway and Sweden. In terms of live fish, it's mostly sourced from Sweden, France, Portugal and Denmark. I will go into all of this in more detail later on in the presentation. Can you change the slide? Then? Thank you. Um, so according to Nielsen, the Spanish consumed a total of 893 million kilograms of seafood in 2018 and spent over 8 billion euros. 
This places Spain among the largest consumers of fish in the world. Spain is the number one importer for seafood in Europe and the number four market in the world behind USA, Japan and China. Given the consumption levels, this is more than the country can supply, so there is a need to source additional product from overseas to satisfy the demand. Can you move to the next slide for me, please? So on this slide, I've broken down the growth by categories. You'll notice that the largest category is fresh fish and seafood, which accounts for 58.1% of the total market. This category fell by 2% between 2017 and 2018, whereas canned products grew by 0.7 during this period to 19.1%. Frozen grew by 0.8 to reach 16%. Chilled products grew by 0.2 to reach 3.6% and 300 million euros in value. And smoked products grew by 0.3 representing 3.1% of the market and accounting for 256 million euros in the Spanish market. Next slide, please. Again, so this slide shows you what the normal route to market is for the seafood in Spain. For seafood caught locally, this comes in via the 28 fishing ports in Spain. The ports of Vigo and La Coruña in Galicia are the, most, are the main points in Spain for unloading fresh fish. These two ports alone accumulated 43% of total fresh fish operations in Spain. The third most important port is Pasajes in the Basque Country and the fourth is the Bay of Cadiz. The local produce then either goes directly through local fishmongers and restaurants, otherwise it follows the same channel as imported products which go via the wholesale markets, most of which are controlled by the public organisation Mercasa. There are currently 23 wholesale markets in Spain, of which 17 include a fish market. The most important wholesale markets for fish and seafood are Mercabarna and Merca Madrid. So Merca Madrid is the largest seafood wholesale market in the world outside of Tokyo and the leader in Europe. It's got 156 seafood companies who commercialised over 172,000 tonnes of seafood products in 2019. And the other important wholesale market in Spain is Mercabarna, which, had, which has got 71 seafood companies who commercialise just over 71,000 tonnes of seafood products in the same year. In these wholesale markets, the price is not set by auction like in fish markets, but purely by supply and demand, depending on the existing quantity and quality and the needs from each side. Therefore, the decision is made between the wholesaler and the retailer or the food service customer based on supply and demand. The critical points in the buying chain are reducing the intermediaries. A lot of the wholesalers prefer for the fish and seafood to come direct from fishing boats to the wholesale market without passing through fishing ports in Scotland. I know it's also a cultural thing to try and lower the costs in Spain. However, the main reason is that they need to keep the prices down as VAT on seafood products currently sits at 10% because it's considered a luxury item. And the fishing industry is trying to get this reduced to 4% to be in line with staple items such as fruit and milk and bread, but so far this request has not been granted. Can you move to the next slide, please? So for retail, the, in the Spanish retail food market, it's very diverse with hypermarkets, supermarkets, convenience stores, discount stores, specialised stores and markets, a bit of everything but the market is dominated by large traditional retailers and the main one is Mercadona, which has 25.8% market share in 2019. Um, Carrefour had a market share of 8.7%, Dia 6.6%, Lidl 5.5%, Eroski 4.9% and Aushan 3.4%. Of the main retailers, only Mercadona and Lidl have shown growth over the last few years. However, since COVID, consumers have been encouraged to shop locally or online due to the lack of mobility. Therefore, regional supermarkets and independent family stores have become popular during confinement for proximity to their homes and also to support local business. As a result, regional supermarket chains multiplied their sales during the first two months of lockdown. The regional stores together now make up 15% of the total grocery market share in Spain, sitting just behind Mercadona. So those are stores like Bon Preo, Consum, Caprabo, Sanchez Romero. Can we move on to the next slide, please? 
So food service, this is where I see most of the opportunities for the Scottish seafood companies. I will go on to discuss the trends and opportunities later in the presentation. However, what I've noticed is that COVID has forced a lot of the food service channel to look at new ways of doing business because they were left with no choice when they had to close in March. In a way, it's opened up people to trying out home deliveries and takeaways, while home delivery companies like Global, Uber Eats, Deliveroo and Stuart were previously mainly working with high street and chain restaurants. There are now a lot more high-end and exclusive restaurants providing services through these delivery companies, including Michelin star restaurants such as Kirei by Kabuki, Ronda 14, Cylindro and Lua. Can you move on to the next slide, please? I'll just touch briefly on e-commerce here. Um, a, re a report by Cantar uh, shows that e-commerce continues to grow in Spain, accounting for 1.9% of the total FMCG market share in 2019. While this is from a low base, Spain is one of the fastest growing e-commerce e markets in recent years, growing from 1.7% in 2016. Cantar's most recent figures in 2020 show that online purchases now account for 3.6% of all revenues in the retail sector since COVID. So it's jumped up again this year. And currently the biggest players in the online FMCG category are Amazon Spain, El Corte Inglés and Carrefour. Together, these three companies account for 20% of all online revenue in Spain. The three platforms mentioned have done really well online because they offer a full service, including click and collect. Moving on. So I'm going to touch again on drive-through services. Um, El Corte Inglés has extended the reach of its Click and Express service, making it available in 54 cities in Spain, enabling shoppers to receive deliveries within two hours of buying. They've also started working in partnership with Alibaba to offer Click and Collect for AliExpress Spain customers. And during confinement, El Corte Inglés took further steps to make things easy for the consumer by offering click and car. Customers can place their orders online and can drive to the selected store, wait in the car park, and a member of staff will bring the items to the car for them. Um, Carrefour offers something similar. They're offering a click and click service where you can click your shopping in the Carrefour hypermarket of your choice within two hours of purchase. Like El Corte Inglés, they are offering Carrefour Drive. You place the order online, wait in the drive section at one of the hypermarkets, and within five minutes, a member of staff will bring the order to the car, and this service is free for offers over 50 euros. And there are other retailers doing the same, so you have Alcampo and Eroski doing something similar. Uh, in my opinion, the omni-channel strategy works best in the food industry in Spain, and includes formats such as online shopping, telephone, drive services, and click and collect. E-commerce and click and collect services will not overtake traditional retail, but should be seen as complementary. Seafood suppliers should consider adopting more than one channel in order to provide the best service to end consumers. Up until now, until COVID, the biggest e-commerce obstacle in Spain had been the fear to buy fresh produce online, as well as concerns over security around payment. However, during confinement, people were forced to consider online platforms and managed to use them with relative ease. And so they're now seeing the benefits of this. Moving on to the next slide, please. Again, thank you. So for opportun opportunities for the companies, um, in terms of the wholesale markets, the main opportunities for Scottish seafood companies selling directly to Mercabarna are for fresh velvet crab, fresh hake, fresh megrum, fresh and frozen langoustine, fresh spider crab and fresh European lobster. And for Merca Madrid, uh, the opportunities are mainly for fresh and frozen squid, fresh and frozen megrum, fresh salmon, fresh velvet crab, live brown crab, fresh mackerel, fresh hake, fresh sole and fresh monkfish. Other key species to note are sea bream and sea bass, which both performed well in terms of volume and, volume and value during the confinement. And along with salmon, they were the most popular species of fresh fish within Spanish stores, according to IRI data. If we look at health and wellness, consumers are now looking for products that are varied and innovative, that promote good health, but also adhere to high quality standards, traceability and sustainability practices. Um, within that organic, there's a trend in Spain and other EU markets for organic fish, especially salmon. The main suppliers of organic salmon to Spain are, uh, are Ireland and the UK. 
um, and in the, from the UK it's mainly Scotland and to a lesser extent Northern Ireland. Uh, vegan and vegetarian, uh, there, there's increasing popularity for the, for, around the health benefits of vegetarian and vegan dishes, along with rising awareness of overfishing and sustainability that are negatively affecting the fish consumption. There's been an overall drop in consumption of fish and seafood in Spain in the last few years. Um, not everyone is giving up meat altogether, but, but they are decreasing their weekly consumption. Looking at private label, um, the main players in the private label space in fish are Pescanova and Profand. Uh, Profand recently bought Calarero from Mercadona in 2019, so that's made them even bigger as a company. Um, given that many consumers will be facing economic struggles right now, some will be looking at private label again, as it is now perceived as being associated with value products rather than low cost. Uh, Mercadona, Lidl, Dia and Aldi have all increased their shelf space for private label during COVID, whereas Carrefour, Al Campo and El Corte Inglés have pushed more branded goods. For salmon, uh, there's regarding the consumption by species, salmon now accounts for 13% of the total market and has overtaken Hake for the very first time. Uh, Hake uh, now has 12% 12, 12 of, the, of the market as it lost 7.9% of sales volume in 2018. The popularity of salmon is partly down to an increased consumption of Hawaiian, Peruvian and Japanese food. So similar to what JC was saying, poke bowls, uh, ceviche and sushi, they're really popular in Spain as well. Um, and also around the, the perceived health benefits of oily fish, that's really increased the growth in salmon. Um, chef packs. Consumers can now order food products for the chef's seal, either in the form of a vacuum packed sachet or semi-finished recipes with instructions on how to finish it at home. Some of the chefs are linking up with products from small producers or local suppliers. Therefore, there is an opportunity to collaborate with the chefs for supplying products and helping in the preparation of recipes on social media. Next slide, please. So there's a new platform called Take a Restaurant, which is collaborating with Anson and Bonnet um, and 30 high-end restaurants in Madrid, many of which have Michelin stars. Uh, how it works is that the catering team arrives at your house one hour before to set up and um, so they'll bring the cutlery and the tablecloths they cook the food and will explain each dish to you just as they would in the restaurant um, and at the end of the meal they clean up the areas used and take away all the used dishes the price is exactly the same as what you would pay if you were dining in the restaurant although there is a service fee which is decided up front depending on how many staff are required for the meal and you can also request additional extras such as having the head chef or sommelier attend. Next slide. Uh, many restaurants have now set up social media pages like Instagram, which allow consumers to order food directly from stories. Uh, consumers can see the photos and videos of the food on stories and with one click it actually takes them to the link to be able to place the order. So it's making things a lot easier um, on social media for companies. Next slide. Canned seafood products. So the COVID crisis has encouraged more consumption of canned fish and seafood products in Spain. In March, consumers increased their purchases by 11% and their spend by 19% according to Cantar. Relating to the period from the 27th of April to the 3rd of May, which was the seventh week of the state of the alarm, um, the acquisition of this category had grown by 13.2% compared to the same period in 2019. I was actually in, in Carrefour on Saturday and was amazed by how much this section had grown. Uh, it almost took up an entire aisle just for canned seafood and fish. The only thing I'll say is that a lot of the products that I see on the shelves are Spanish, so they are promoting things like cockles from Galicia, mackerel from the south of Spain and tuna from the north. And many of the companies are also using Spanish olive oil to preserve the products. Next slide, please. Just going to look at this one briefly. So there's a number of the retailers and department stores that now rent out a section of their stores um, to fish smokers and also sushi suppliers as these type of products are growing in retail as well as food service. So these are just some examples. Moving on. Challenges. Um, so obviously no surprise with the top one COVID. Um, this was something unexpected that has essentially shut down the food service channel for the last three months. Um, not all of these businesses will open up again, so it will be interesting to see how the market changes. 
Also, there are currently no longer any large scale corporate events and food buffets and hotels are no more. Uh, Brexit, there are continued fears about Brexit and cost implications. So a lot of the wholesalers are buying from Ireland, which is still part of the EU, and they're also buying from other EU countries. Uh, and there's a lot of competition from Norway uh, for salmon, especially, as roughly about 60% of the salmon that comes into Spain is Norwegian. Exports of whole fresh Norwegian salmon to Spain increased in the first four months of 2020 compared to 2019, reaching just over 21,000 tonnes, which is a 12% increase. Although in the case of fresh salmon fillets, there has been a slight decrease in volume of 2.5% and value of 1.9%, according to Revista Aral. Uh, some of the retailers have formed strategic partnerships with Norwegian companies, which makes it difficult to introduce Scottish products. For example, in 2018, Mercadona partnered with Leroy Seafood Group, which is a Norwegian company and the world's second largest salmon producer. Um, smoked salmon, around 50% of consumption of smoked fish occurs in the summer and Christmas period, but most of this is Norwegian smoked salmon. The main players are Ubago, uh, Gimar, Chantelmar, Copesco and Seprisa, La Balinesa and Vensi, and currently the market is dominated by seven companies along with distributor own brand, which account for more than 90% of sales in Spain. In the tourism market, so the government has been keen to get Spanish people carrying out national tourism and international tourists to come back to Spain post-COVID. For the past seven years, Spain has been breaking records for tourism, reaching its peak in 2019 when the country received 83.7 million tourists that spent just over 92 million euros, an increase of 2.9% compared to 2018. If we look at that compared to now, in the first three months of 2020, only 10.6 million foreign tourists visited Spain, which was 3.6 million less than in the same period in 2019. And this has implied a reduction of income of close to 4 million euros. Um, by local, and I'm assuming this happens in Scotland as well, the Spanish government has been encouraging consumers to support their local economy, buy local and carry out local tourism as a result of COVID. This has already been seen in food service and retail. According to Cantar's COVID-19 barometer, 73% of Spaniards favour buying Spanish products. E-commerce has shot up during COVID with a lot of fishmongers setting up websites to do online sales because all of the bars, restaurants and hotels were shut so they lost that business during the confinement. And for e-commerce and seafood, this tends to be consumers buying fresh produce from local fishmongers. Um, and in retail, chains such as Sanchez, Romero, Carrefour, Eroski, Coviran and Hyperbear are prioritising local products on their shelves. Sanchez Romero launched a campaign to promote Spanish food under the motto Por Ti Por Todos. The 25 Carrefour hypermarkets in Madrid joined under the motto um, Now More Than Ever Products from Madrid to promote products from 34 local companies. And Hyperbear is focused on the commercialization of products of national origin. Um, and in the fish and fruit and vegetable sections, 85% of it is from Spain. Also, Fede Pesca, which is the National Federation of Frozen Fish and Products Retail Business Associations, very catchy, has joined forces with Global to make it possible for the products of more than 7,000 traditional fishmongers to move towards digitalization while promoting local proximity and sustainable trade. Moving on to the next slide. Next again. So as I mentioned previously, in Spain they mainly buy local products, but there are examples of Irish seafood in the market. And so I've just put some examples of some of the products that are in El Corte Inglés and Carrefour, which is where you see most of the Irish products in retail. Uh, moving on to the next slide. <coughs> I haven't really mentioned Scottish smoked salmon much in the presentation because I see very limited opportunities here. Most of the smoked salmon comes from Norway. Um, but I've added some examples of the Scottish products in market so you can see the pricing, the packaging and retailers that stock them. On this slide I've shown examples of branded product and I know that there are opportunities to work with some of the Spanish fish smokers to provide fresh fish for smoking. Moving on to the next slide. And these are just some of the examples of the private label Scottish salmon products um, in El Campo and Carrefour. Uh, Vensi, they provide the Scottish salmon products for Carrefour and La Balinesa provide the ones for Alcampo. 
moving on. <clears throat> and here are some of the, the product and packaging examples relating to health and wellness. You'll notice that some of them have, um, well, they all have key messaging relating to reduced salt. And some of them also have um, the EU ecological bio stamp on the products, which is important to Spanish consumers. Next slide. Spain is starting to see, um, well, they're starting to use more of the Nutri-Score label on products, um, although this isn't as popular as it is in the UK just yet. Uh, consumers are increasingly looking at the MSC and EU ecological biostamp, as shown in the previous slide. Uh, the seafood company Copesca and Seprisa have also started to add their own stamp to products, showing that they are committed to sustainable fishing. Next slide. So it's not only brands who are looking at sustainability, retailers are also starting to focus on this more and more as it's important to customers. Little Spain is guaranteeing that 50% of their seafood is sustainably sourced. El Corte Inglés has the MSC label on various seafood and fish products in store. Eroski, more than half of their products have the, had the MSC certification in 2019. And Aldi has the MSC Eco label on its own brand products. Uh, and it, in addition, it also works with the ASC um, seal and nearly 50% of Aldi's frozen fish products are certified. Next slide. Uh, this is just regarding Carrefour. So they've committed to buying seafood daily from 66 fish markets around Spain in order to supply product that's fresh and also to be able to support the local business. Uh, on top of this, the retailer has agreed to guarantee stable prices of Hake at Salero fish market for a three month period. So they're really supporting um, local business. And finally, uh, if you move on to the last slide, this is just around events. So there's two main events in Spain. Um, you'll be familiar probably with the first one. Uh, so that's the Seafood Expo Global, which uh, for 2021 will be hel held at FIRA in Barcelona instead of Brussels. Um, and then the second one is Conchamar. And that is organised by the Spanish Association for Wholesalers, Importers, Manufacturers and Exporters of Fish Products and Aquaculture. It's going to be held in Vigo, which is a really important fishing port, uh, and it will be held in October 2021. 20, it's mainly, well, it is only for frozen seafood, uh, so very specific. However, it is attended by the majority of the seafood importers and buyers uh, and wholesalers, so worth walking the show. And that's me, so it's just my contact details at the end if you have any questions at all. Thank you very much, Audrey. And also, um, thank you very much, JC, as well. Those were both um, great presentations. Um, we've got a couple of questions um, which we can go through just now. Um, so the first one is for you, um, JC, and it is, I see diver scallops and oysters included in the inception phase. Are bivalves approved to be exported to the US? Yep, it's a good question. Um, so at the moment for the US market, they are still, uh, still banned. Uh, in Canada, they are okay to be exported uh, under kind of some, some, some limited... Um, uh, import opportunities um, but one of the things that's been worked on um, is the uh, is some discussions around trying to lift the ban on the bivalves in the US market so I've included it in the presentation in part <coughs> for Canada um, but also we, we continue to keep an eye on um, what's happening in the US on, on the bivalve side because certainly it's uh, it's an area of, of potential opportunity for us once that ban is lifted. Okay, perfect. And another question that we've got is, are we able to share a copy of the presentations? And yes, we can send those, we can send those round after, um, after the webinar. Um, that's no, no that was an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And we have one other question that has come in that um, has now, how would you go how would you go about recommending finding an importer for farmed salmon and trout? Is that for both markets or? It's for all panelists, so it's for both markets. What do you, do you want, want to go 
So for far, well, I, I, I've got the contact, so it's just a case of um, speaking to your trade advisor in Scotland and linking in with me, and I'm happy to make those introductions for you. So, um, yeah, obviously the importers are very specific ones for the seafood industry, and so I'm, I'm already in contact with most of them. Um, the majority are the wholesalers that are in the uh, wholesale markets that I mentioned, Mercabarna and Mercamadrid, so I've already made contact with most of them. So. Yeah, and similarly for the US market, uh, again, um, we, we have uh, a number of contacts uh, in major importers around the country. There's always strong demand for uh, salmon and uh, increasingly for uh, trout, uh, steelhead trout as it's called here, um, whether it's in the US or in Canada. So uh, again, uh, through, through the SDI routes uh, in Scotland, um, you'll access our services and be able to then tap into that assistance. For, for Spain, in terms of the trout, there's a specific, they use specific sizes here. So I think we've had problems with this in Scotland in the past that we don't have the right size requirement, but I can double check that because I'm sure we've had that question before. I've got it written down, the exact sizes that they look for. I think it's, I don't know whether our, our ones are too big or too small, it's one or the other. <laughs> so I can't remember, but we don't have the right size requirement. Yeah, and obviously on, on size for seafood, um, I mean, certainly the U.S. Um, continues to like bigger, fresh fish, uh, particularly in salmon and trout, um, as well as uh, uh, in white fish, uh, portion sizes tend to be larger uh, in North America. So that's something just to bear in mind um, as, you, um, as you look at our market. When you look at... Um, Value added, uh, certainly um, portion sizes in value added are, are probably a bit more on the um, similar vein to European uh, sizes. So value added, whether it's value added uh, fresh, uh, chilled, or uh, value added frozen, um, those sizes tend to be, um, in terms of individual portions, tend to be around the same sort of sizes as, as, as the UK and Europe. What you tend to see though is that the overall pack size tends to be larger. So you, you may get instead of a, a pack for two people, you would typically get four to six um, in, a, in, a, in a frozen pack. So the pack sizes are generally retailed um, at a larger size. Thank you. We've got another question that's come in, um, which is for you, Audrey. We have started a small market for soft shell clams, sand gapers in London. Do you see any potential for the Spanish market to accept a new species at the moment? <sighs> Probably not. <laughs> um, I think that, like I said in the presentation, it's really difficult at the moment because a lot of the products, they're really focused on buying local products where they can. So if if it's something they can produce themselves or supply themselves, they will go down that route. So there's really only specific products that they will look to uh, imported markets for. Uh, and certainly for the UK and Ireland, there it was the list that I've put on one of those slides. Those are the kind of main products that are coming in from the UK. Um, and I don't really see them moving away from that, but it's, it's not a no, it's just from experience, it's not what I'm getting asked for. Um, so the, for me, the seafood sector is one of the only subsectors um, in Spain where I actually get the buyers coming to me to ask for products. So they're very specific about what it is that look for. Um, and when I go to them with other types of species, etc., it, it's not really something that they're looking at. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Audrey. We have got another one here, and this is another question for you, Audrey, as well. We find we are only able to work with one or two customers in Mercabana and Merca Madrid. Can you recommend how to get information on importers in the other regions to take the pressure away from these more competitive markets? Yeah. What I tend to find is when I'm speaking to the wholesalers in both of those um, wholesale markets, they're, they're competing a lot with the other wholesalers that are there. And what they get frustrated with is other companies. So they do mention some Scottish companies to me that are working with everybody and anybody and that annoys them because they want to only be supplied, you know, just them and not other people. So I understand why it's only ever really one or two customers in those um, wholesale markets. 
like I said, those are the two main ones, but there are other wholesale markets. So you've got the Merca Sevilla, you've got Merca Valencia, you've also got wholesalers that don't necessarily sit within those wholesale markets. Those are the ones that are um, managed by Mercasa, which is a public organisation, but we still have importers and wholesalers that are outside of that. So that's a different avenue that we can look at. Uh, so happy to do that. Okay, thank you again, Audrey. Um, and one for JC. What is the current health certification required for USA and Canada for smoked fish? <laughs> okay, that's a. <clears throat> I won't pretend to be a technical expert when it comes to certification. So, um, but certainly the the basics um, foods uh, for for our market for uh, the US obviously would be the FDA registration and uh, USDA. Uh, compliance um, on uh, on listeria uh, and those types of um, uh, bacteria. So um, if any of those are picked up, then you go on to an automatic uh, import alert list. Um, uh, so there are there's some very specific requirements um, that again we can share with you online uh, or can be found on the FDA's website. Um, in terms of Canada. Quite similar, the uh, CBSA, which is the Canada Border Services, um, and the C uh, Canadian uh, Food Standards Agency, the CBSA, um, again have similar uh, health certification requirements for for imported smoked uh, fish. Uh, and again, we can direct you to the right resources there. Um, so we'll we'll make sure that we can get some of that information available to you. Excellent, thank you. Um, another one for you, Audrey, um, which is regarding the shellfish, the live shellfish market in Spain, particularly live lobsters, live langoustine, live brown crab. How is the market reacting at the moment with COVID-19? And how are wholesalers reacting in Vigo, Merca Madrid and a Barcelona market? So I don't know how they're reacting in Vigo because I've not had a chance to get there because I'm obviously stuck in Barcelona right now. But I have had contact with the, the wholesalers in Merca Barna and Merca Madrid for the last three months. Um, so they're keeping me updated on what's happening. Um, there's still an interest. I mean, what happens in the Spanish market and did happen with the last economic crisis is there's no middle ground anymore. So you've either got people buying own label, private label products, and then you've got the other end of the, the the market where people are still buying luxury products so people in Spain still want to spend money on food and drink it's really important to them and they're not going to stop doing that so luxury items are still important and shellfish in general is seen as an important part of the, the Mediterranean diet so that's not going to change anytime soon um, and like I mentioned in the presentation a lot of the restaurants themselves are starting to do new ways of working so that they can still get the product to the, the consumers. You've got a lot of the fishmongers now selling online, which they've never have done before. So it's, um, people are still buying those products. It's just maybe doing it through different channels now. Yeah, maybe I can, I'm just going to add to that from, from, from uh, my market's perspective, because it's quite similar. I mean, certainly in the last uh, three or four months, you've obviously had to shut down of seafood counters. So a lot of that has transitioned over to obviously frozen, um, but also chilled uh, retail. Uh, chilled retail uh, value added uh, has been an area of significant growth. Um, again, uh, consumers uh, love to consume seafood. The perennial issue is, uh, particularly in our market, is folks um, find it uh, uh, hard or complicated to do seafood, uh, which it's not obviously, as we all know, but, but there is a, a real uh, fear around how to handle and prepare seafood. That's very different to the Mediterranean uh, experiences, as Audrey will say. But, uh, but certainly what we are seeing um, is, is the trend in, on the food service side where food service has remained open um, but mainly for takeout and, and pick up and delivery, uh, pretty much all the way through COVID is menu, simplifi menu simplification. So that is to say that because they want to reduce the amount of interactions within, uh, within a kitchen, the, you've seen a much uh, bigger jump in um, you know, pre-prepared um, uh, seafood, seafood that's, that's, that's portioned, 
uh, and ready to be added to, say, a poke bowl or, say, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a nice salmon dish that can be easily, easily and chef prepared, but with the minimum of handling. So the onus then starts to shift uh, back through the supply chain to producers to say, OK, how can you help us? Um, have products that are menu ready or as many ready as possible so that uh, when they arrive in the restaurant there's a, there's a minimum amount of handling a minimum amount of um, prepping in order to get that um, out onto, onto market and still be um, a presentable product when it's been taken out um, and we're really going to see that continue e even as, as restrictions ease and as dining starts to come back in to restaurants um, that menu simplification process is continuing. Uh, menu rationalization, um, just being able to do better things um, much more simply. And again, that's reflected in some of the some of the flavor profiles that you're starting to see that that, that, that I illustrated earlier. Is how flavors are being used uh, and simple ingredients are being used to complement seafood. So that there's a minimum amount of um, um, additional handling and processing um, by restaurants or indeed by retail or, and, and the consumer as a result. Okay, thank you, JC. Um, following on from the question that we had around the health certification required for the US and Canada, um, is there a minimum standard such as SALSA or BRC required for either market? Um, the answer is it depends. Um, if you are, uh, so BRC is certainly the gold standard that is used um, across North America uh, at all retailers and uh, larger food service um, uh, outlets. Um, Salsa is recognized by some uh, outlets and by some places. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's less common. Um, smaller premium grocery retailers um, who are used to sourcing in Europe understand salsa and are quite uh, open to dealing with producers who are salsa only. But by, by and large, um, if you're BRC accredited um, and have the accreditations um, in place, um, that's that's where you're going to have the big tick box for for, for, for most retailers and, and for the larger food service. And it's quite similar actually for Spain in terms of BRC tends to be more important if they're selling it into retail and that would be the, the kind of main retailers, the ones that I mentioned on the slides previously. Um, if it's some of the regional ones, not as much and salsa isn't really recognised that much in the Spanish market. Um, so BRC, yes, but that's for the kind of big retailers. Yeah, I think certainly in seafood, you know, they're looking at, you know, MSC, ASC accreditation. They're looking at, uh, in North America, Monterey Bay Aquarium. Um, they're looking at uh, some of the global seafood standards and certainly seafood buyers, particularly retail food service, seafood buyers are, are much more used to seeing those and having that kind of uh, discussion. And again, you know, the discussions that they want to have with you as producers is, you know, what does your sustainability, traceability practices look like? What, what does the supply chain look like? Um, can you, you know, can you guarantee me, you know, boat to plate, um, you know, traceability, for instance, um, and the use of things like blockchain technology, RFID, um, all those types of technologies start to help to, um, demonstrate and tell that story so it's less about brc and uh and salsa um unless it's obviously a packaged product but it's much more about the the aquaculture uh and an msc certification that uh there is out there that's globally recognized exactly the same for the spanish market so it's msc and asc um and also the bio ecological eu stamp um on on the secret clock, so it's around sustainable practices and things like that. It's not so much about BRC. Yeah. Uh, uh, in terms of bio, um, our, uh, obviously in the US, it's USDA certified organic. Um, and in Canada, they've literally in the last um, week or so just published new rules around organic certification, particularly from Europe. Um, 
Now, those will probably get re-resolved through um, UK, Canada bilateral trade agreements, um, but the EU-Canadian trade agreement does uh, recognize an element of um, reciprocation, but uh, those rules are literally changing um, at the moment in Canada for, for organic certification, particularly around salmon. Um, but, uh, but generally, uh, to be certified in the US, your US uh, your USDA certification for organic. Um, Soil Association uh, European uh, Organic can't be called organic in the market, um, or they can't be certified organic in, in the US market. Okay, thank you both very much. Um, Audrey, question for you. Um, someone's just looking for clarification on whether they understood you properly. <laughs> Is there a chance for smoked salmon bio in Spain at the moment? I would say no. <laughs> so what I was saying on, this, on the presentation was there's opportunities to work with some of the fish smokers here. So Spanish fish smokers by supplying the fresh produce for them to smoke themselves. Um, and you'll find that a lot with the, the market in terms of there's a lot of big players in the market already who work with some of the Nor Norwegian suppliers and are already working with some of the Scottish ones. Um, so they would look at it through that route. But other than that, I don't use an opportunity for very much uh, smoked salmon uh, products in the market uh, in terms of the retail side of things. It's very, very, very small. Um, I mean, if you're, if you're looking on the shelves, there's probably about 30 Norwegian products to maybe two Scottish. Um, it's just, and the problem with it is they, they can get it for a decent price uh, and it's perceived to be high quality, so there's no reason for them to change that to Scottish produce because they perceive the Norwegian to be of a high standard anyway. So not very much, but happy to look at it. It's not, no, it's just, it's difficult. It's very difficult to get in. No problem. Okay, I think that's all the questions we have had come in, um, unless anybody has a has anything else that they would like to add and um, thank you very much JC and Audrey for for doing this presentation for us um, Audrey and JC have shared their contact details on their presentations we will circulate the presentations either later today or tomorrow um, also if anyone has any additional questions there is myself who covers um, Asia, Europe and the Middle East and my colleague Claire McDougall who works with JC and covers the North American market as well. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. Apologies for some of the technical issues that we had with Audrey's presentation. Um, just one of the downsides of having to move into a digital world at the moment. But thank you very much for your time and thank you again uh, JC and Audrey. Thanks everyone. Thank you.